Good morning, Stones Hill. I am Tom Leach, and it's my honor to, to be here today to speak with you. I have some exciting things to talk about, some areas I'm very passionate about, some areas that I've, I've just grown to, to love within the church. Uh, today I'm actually going to be talking about two distinct groups. Uh, these are, are groups, again, that I, I've grown to have a passion for because I, I realize the importance of these two groups. When I started an internship here almost four years ago, which is hard to believe, uh, I started here four years ago. It's just an amazing thing. God's done so many things through me. But when I started, I was asked by the pastors to uh, come up with a couple of areas that I'm, I'm excited about and, and work within those areas. And I had two big things I wanted to do. I wanted to start a, a young adults ministry and I wanted to start a men's ministry. And or, or revamp these because they were not currently in process. But they, were, they encouraged me, why don't we just find one area that you're excited about and, and stick with that. So I chose to, to work with the young adults at first. And, and I was so excited about the young adults because there's just such a great group of, of individuals. And they're a group of individuals that are in our church that they're often overlooked. Uh, you, you kind of go from youth group to adult ministries. And it's just like, okay, you know, I'm not... Maybe I'm not quite an adult in mindset yet. Maybe I still need some of the basic teachings. So I, I had started that ministry based upon that. Um, eventually I would, I would help to start up the men's ministry here at Stones Hill. And I saw the, the excitement of um, the men's ministry here because I was involved in a men's ministry uh, at my previous church when we lived out in Wyoming. And it was just such an amazing thing, just to, to have a group of guys that would come together and just to, to spend time in God's Word. I, I seen the importance of that. I seen the importance of having mentors that just walk beside you and just to, to build you up and encourage you. So I think these two groups, and, and when I was asked to, to give a vision uh, for today, these two groups are, are just such an important uh, set of groups for, for the church, but it's important to realize that they have a lot of correlation. They have a lot in common. You, you see, these two groups are, are both integral parts of the church. They're important parts of the church. But the problem is these are groups of the church that are often overlooked or often missing. When we, we have a lot of men that choose not to attend, we have a lot of young adults that as soon as they, they get out of their parents' home, uh, maybe they are church-going parents, but they, they choose to walk a different way. They choose, instead of following God's plan, they, they go their own way to, to try to find their own uh, understanding about life. So today I'm just going to give you the vision behind these groups here at Stones Hill, and I want you to understand why these, uh, these ministries matter to other ministries. And I want you to understand why these ministries, why these individuals matter to Christianity as a whole. Uh, in a book I was reading by Chuck Swindoll, The Church Awakening, An Urgent Call for Renewal, he described that one of his fondest memories goes back to a time where he spent um, summers with his grandfather at his grandfather's cottage in southern Texas. See, this cottage, it was near uh, Mat Matagorda Bay, near the Gulf of Mexico. He, he described it as a sleepy little spot where the, the air smelled like salt water and shrimp 24-7. Swindoll described how the cottage set back off of a small cliff that dropped off into the, the bay. Uh, and as his grandfather had described, he told him that every year that this little cliff that is the, the cottage was set off of, it wears away a little bit every year. There's something called erosion that happens, he described. He described how the waves, as they beat back and forth against this bay that it just carves into the rocks. His grandfather had put a stake into the ground so that way he could measure the amount of erosion that would occur each and every week, each and every year. Um, every year, Chuck Swindoll, he, he, when he visited his grandfather, he enjoyed going out with the tape measure and measuring to see how much of this ground had been taken away. You know, one year there'd be eight, eight inches, the next there'd be 12, and so on. You see, in the same way that we experience erosion uh, with water, the church has experienced erosion. 
Webster defines erosion in simple terms to diminish or destroy by degrees, to eat away by slow destruction of substance, to cause to deteriorate or disappear. Erosion is a slow process. See, erosion is not something you're going to see by just visually looking at it. You're not going to see the ground disappearing because it's a process that takes a while. But when you put a stake in the ground and something that's visible that you can measure to see the erosion, you, you see the effects. You see that there's inches, there's, there's feet that are being taken away. In the same way in the church, there's erosion going on. The beliefs that we once held so near and dear, we've let go of, we've stopped caring about. We've let this erosion of the world come into our lives. We need to be careful to set a stake now. So that way we can, we can fight against this erosion. We can throw whatever we have at this erosion. As I prepared for this message, I went to social media uh, you know, that's like the place to get all the answers, right? I went to social media to see um, what some of the responses to this erosion were. I wanted to, to ask the questions of why is it that men are falling away from the church? Why is it that young adults are falling away from the church? You know, to start with the men, I, I wasn't surprised by most of the answers, but still it was hard to hear. Still it was hard for me to think about the reasons why uh, so often men choose not to come to church. One common reason was, was pride. It appears that most men do not want anyone else to tell them what to do. They don't want anyone else to tell them what to believe. They, they also tend to feel judged or feel like uh, others are too hypocritical. I, I don't know how many times I've heard that statement. You know, it's just, just a bunch of hypocrites meeting there on Sundays, right? And those that choose not to come because, you know, this is my only day off. This is my day that I get to relax. I get to sit at home, watch sports. I get to sit at home, play video games. You know, oh, there's a lot of work around the house that needs to get done. And I want to tell you, I could probably make up the same excuses every week. I could probably think of a, a couple hundred things that I should be doing, that I need to be doing, right? Well, you know what? God's called me here. And, and that's the same with these men. We need to realize that God has called us here. He wants us to meet together. See, this is a problem that the church is facing. This is a problem the church in America especially is facing. And, you know, it's interesting to note the fact that this, uh, again, this is an area of erosion that we've experienced where, where men are often lacking in leadership. And this is probably the reason why America is actually becoming one of the, the quickest growing mission fields. Now think about that. As Americans, we are priding ourselves on the fact that we send others to other countries to be missionaries. Yet, we're now one of the leading groups that are, are taking in missionaries. Because we're falling away from our basic Christian doctrine so much that others have to come and tell us about Christ. Again, I believe some of the most erosion is occurring between the time that students leave high school and the time that they reach adulthood. So to confront this erosion, we need to understand the truths of God's word. We need to learn to defend those same truths through apologetics. Apologetics meaning that we're defending the Christian faith. We need to learn the doctrines of Christ. We need to be in our Bibles. We need to be spending time with him. See, again, apologetics, the, the defending of the Christian faith is like that stake in the ground. This is how we, we take this stand. This is how we can measure how far away from God's standards we have gone. If you go to the next slide, again, I'm going to start out with men's ministry. We'll, we'll work our way into young adults' ministry, but I, I think you'll see how these will connect as we go along. Here at Stones Hill Community Church, uh, we have a, a vision behind the way we do men's ministry. And we realize that men were designed to be warriors for Christ. These men in this church, were de uh, were de our desire is to be defenders of our faith and our families. See, unfortunately, society has beaten us down. And it's beaten down this God-ordained image of malehood. We should also strive to be a better father and husband. 
And we should know that it's okay to desire honor and respect. Again, we live in a world that tells us these things are not accurate. We, we live in a world that tells us that we shouldn't be striving for such things. See, men, we've been lied to for generations. We've been told that to believe such things is chauvinistic. We've been told that when we act like men, we're barbaric. We've been called names. We've been lied to, men. We've been told that to be a man is wrong. To, to live this way is wrong. See, we've bought this lie at a cost. And this cost has been at our families. This cost has been at our churches. This cost has been at Christianity as a whole. See, men are no longer holding the roles they once did. I was watching a a television show last night, and it was talking about uh, fathers dating their daughters. They were were talking about purity balls and and the fact that, you know, these these guys, they were uh, doing something that was extraordinary. They were loving their kids in the way that Christ called them to love them. I mean, it was such an it was such an awesome thing to see, but it, it broke my heart because every couple of seconds, the reporter that was was interviewing these dads, she was just throwing in these little quips about, "Well, the feminists are not going to like that at all." Well, you know what? I don't. The, the one pastor, he was like, "I don't care what the feminists said because God's word has told me this is right." And you know what? I, God's word has been here a lot longer than these feminists have. And, and you know, that's so true, but we, we often let the world dictate what we believe and how we believe it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not up here to, to start a, a riot, to start a fight and say that, you know, women's rights aren't important because that is, that is completely not where I'm going. But again, it's cost us a, a, a generation of, of men. The, the fact that we've let these lines be so blurred. See, our goal here at Stones Hill is to define manhood biblically. We want you to understand that there is a role for men here in this world. There's a role that we need to take seriously. Society around us, it blurs these lines of what it means to be a man. See, definitions vary by the world's standards. But by biblical standards, you know, we have a call to be real men. As one who rejects passivity, we're supposed to stand up. We're supposed to uh, accept responsibility for the things that we've done, for the things that have been done in this world. We're, we're supposed to lead courageously. And you know what? We're, we're called to invest in eternity. Invest in eternity. You know, that, that this life is a short life that we live. And ultimately, our goal should, should be uh, for the, the future. It shouldn't just be for the here and now, but it should be for, for ways that we're going to affect the world to come. If you go to the next slide, please. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Colossians 1. We're going to be going uh, to verse 28 through 29. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard. Um, I, I feel like this one, uh, and again, it's up on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn in there because this is different than, than other versions I found. But I like the way that the New American Standard says this. It says, We proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. So just to start, <clears throat> sorry, just to start out, we, we proclaim him. We proclaim Jesus, admonishing. Admonishing means that we rebuke, we warn, we correct where, where there's false doctrines out there. We're called to admonish, we're called to correct these, these false beliefs. And we're called to teach every man with wisdom. See, we're called to do this so that we can present them complete in Christ. What does it mean to be complete in Christ, you might think? And, and I, I have that same question, but, but to realize this is such an important aspect. To be complete, uh, complete in Christ means that we are happy being a man. It means that we provide for our families. It means we fight for righteousness' sake. And it means that we have close male friends that encourage us in our faith and that we're faithful to our wives. And if we're not married, we're faithful to keeping ourselves sexually pure before marriage. You see, to be complete in Christ requires these things. Men, you know, we, we should get together for many reasons. And uh, here at Stones Hill, the, these are often reasons why we gather. And, and uh, I enjoy the men's ministry that we have. And we're able to do several of these things. But we, we get together to pray. We should get together for discipleship, to, to build each other up. We should get together to evangelize, to, to spread the word of Christ. 
And we should get together to study God's word and to serve the poor and the widows. See, again, this is what we strive for here at Stones Hill. This is when we do men's ministry, we we try to incorporate these things. Uh, A lot of times we will meet together for fun activities as well. And I don't want to say that it's not important to meet together for fun things. But but these are the things that we try to focus in on. These are the things that, that God has laid on our hearts that we can be excited about. If you'll go to the next slide, uh, see, we see the importance of walking together as men, especially in light of this passage. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Now, when we gather together as men, it's our goal, it's our purpose here to build each other up. And, And we live in a world where we've been dented, our swords have become dull. We have become dull to God's word. And, and what we do when we meet together is, is we start to sharpen each other. We start to see the importance of building each other up. And that's why we gather. We, we gather so that way we can uh, build one another. That way we can sharpen one another with God's word. And this is important as you'll see uh, due to these next statistics. If you go ahead to the next slide. Uh, I've wrote all these statistics out for you, but... This is, this is kind of hard to, to comprehend. This is hard to just take setting down. It's, it just makes me want to get up and fight a lot of these statistics. See, a typical U.S. congregation draws an adult crowd that's 61% female, 39% male. See, the gender gap, it's not just adults. This is, this is from children to adults. On any given Sunday, there are 13 million more adult women than men in America's churches. 13 million. This Sunday alone, almost 25% of married church-going women will worship without their husbands. Midweek activity is often draw 70 to 80% female participants. The majority of church employees are are women except for ordained clergy who are overwhelmingly male. Next slide, please. Over 70% of boys who are being raised in the church will abandon uh, abandon it during their teens and 20s. Many of these boys will never return. Again, this is where it breaks into, you know, men and young adults. We're losing groups of individuals here. More than 90% of American men believe in God and five out of six call themselves Christians but only one out of six attends church on a given Sunday. See, the average man accepts the reality of Jesus Christ but they fail to see any value in going to church. You know, when I, I went on to Facebook, I did a survey trying to figure out what is the reason and I got these same statistics saying, you know what, why do we need to gather together as men? I, I'm a believer in Christ, but what do I need with the church? Do I really need to come to church to believe in Christ? And you know what, I was a, as a young man, I was somebody that bought into that lie. I was somebody that said, you know what, there, I'm a, I, I believe in Christ and I, I believe that, you know, he, he died for me. I believe that, right? Well... Truthfully, when I started coming to church, I realized what I had believed was a lie. I didn't really know who Christ was. And I didn't realize the importance of the body of believers. We gather together here for a reason. We, we gather to be built up. We gather to encourage one another. We gather so that way we can correct false doctrines. And, and that's what's often missing. Churches overseas, they report gender gaps that are up to nine women for every adult male in attendance. Uh, Christian universities are becoming convents. The typical Christian college in the U.S. enrolls almost two women for every one man. Fewer than 10% of U.S. churches are able to establish or maintain a va- uh, vibrant men's ministry. So, uh, again, I, I feel like here at Stones Hill, we, we've done a great job of of getting a vibrant group of men together that, that we're really in a process of building men up. And, and I don't want this to sound like a downer on men. I don't want you guys to also walk away feeling like, man, oh, just I'm a guy and now I'm feeling really depressed because all these statistics talking about me. But what I want you to realize is you guys are important here. The men that are here in this, this audience today, you are all an important part of the church. And 
We need to stop letting the world take so much ground for us. We need to put our stakes in the ground and say, you know what, we're taking a stand here and now. Because it's important. It's important that men continue to gather together. The next slide, please. The, the next slide talks about why church is actually good for men. Now think about this. Church is good for men because churchgoers are more likely to be married. And they actually express a higher level of satisfaction with life. Church involvement is the most important predictor of marital stability and happiness. So if you're a man and a wife here today, I applaud that because you know what? You're, you're actually fighting for your marriages by being here. Church involvement moves people out of poverty. Think about that. You know, when people are involved with churches, they're, they're moving out of poverty. It's also correlated with less depression, more self-esteem, and greater family and marital happiness. Religious participation leads men to become more engaged husband and fathers. This next one I think every man strives for. Teens with religious fathers are more likely to say they enjoy spending time with dad and that they admire him. I mean, think about that, guys. If that's the only reason you're here today, what a great thing to be able to say that, you know what, my kids admire me, that my kids actually enjoy spending time with me. I, I pray that that's not the only reason you're here, but realize that there's, there's a correlation between your attendance here and the way your children actually look at you, the way they view you. This next one is also important. Men are good for the church. Now think about that. That's something you don't often hear, but... A study from Hartford Seminary found that the presence of involved men was statistically correlated with church growth, health, and harmony. Meanwhile, a lack of male participation is strongly associated with congregational decline. When men aren't present, the church is not growing. You know, and, and that's something we need, to, we need to look at. We need to realize, again, there's importance here. I'm going to read some more statistics to you. I know this is getting kind of repetitive with statistics, but I, I feel like this is the world we're living in right now, and, and we need to be aware of these things so that way, we, again, we can combat some of them. If a mother and church attend uh, church on a regular basis, their children are 33% more likely to attend, attend on a regular basis, if, uh, and only 25% of them will uh, end up not attending at all. If it's only the mother that attends and the father does not attend church at all, get this, 2% of children will attend on a regular basis. Over 60% of them will never attend. If a father attends church regularly and the mother does not, 44% of their children will attend church regularly. 34% of their children will not attend at all. So the, the numbers are, are amazing to think. The fact that a father's role is, is really an important one. The fact that when fathers are attending church, their children are so much likely, more likely to attend as well. When fathers are present, so are children. I, I, again, that's such an important thing that we need to realize. Now here's, here's another one that I found very impressive. If the mother was the first to become a Christian in the household, there's a 17% probability that everyone in the household will follow. Now, now listen to that. 17% if the mother was the first. Now, if the father is the first to become a Christian in the household, there's a 93% possibility, probability, that everyone in the household will follow. Again, guys, we play an important role in the spiritual upbringing of our children. We need to realize the importance of, of leading well in our houses. We need to realize that we're, we're leading our families. We're leading the churches. Here at Stones Hill, you know, you, we have a wide variety of ways that men can become involved. Maybe you're thinking, okay, you know, this sounds great. How, how can I get involved? We have a wide variety of ways. And here's, here's a few, but they're not limited to these. We have spiritual parenting classes. We have father-son classes. We have a men's ministry. We, we actually do men's workday projects with the men's ministry. We have volunteer positions within Rock Solid. We have volunteer positions within, within children's ministry. We have volunteer positions within worship ministry, within Celebrate Recovery, and Sunday school classes. We have mentoring opportunities for you men. But what we need for you is to step up. 
We need men to, to stop letting the world push us around. We need to step up and be encouragers of our faith. We need to step up and be courageous. We need to step up and lead. Wives, women, this is what I want you to do. I need you to encourage your men. I need you to encourage them to be leaders. And maybe sometimes that means stepping aside. Because I know we have a lot of strong women out in this congregation. And sometimes it is hard to, to let others lead. Maybe you, you have a husband who's, who's not a gifted leader. But what I need you to do is say, you know what? Maybe you take this this time. Maybe here's how you can uh, lead us in this way. Encourage them. Respect them. Honor them. Support them. Again, maybe, maybe your husband's not a gifted leader. And, and there are times where, as, as a wife, you're going to need to lead. And I understand that, and I respect that. But at the same time, find ways to encourage your husbands to, to lead. Find ways to encourage them to step up, to step out of their comfort zone. Because growth comes out of stepping out of our comfort zone. Men, I need you to be leaders. I want you to love your wives. And I want you to love your children unconditionally. I want you to serve your wives. Love the Lord. Serve the Lord. And here's the next and the last. I want you to give up your life for your wives as Christ gave up his life for the church. We need to stop being selfish as men and stop worrying only about our own needs. But realize we have a family. We have, we have wives. We have children. We have a body of believers that we need to start worrying about as well and stop worrying so much about ourselves. The next slide, we're going we're gonna to now kind of break into young adults. And again, you, you've seen some correlations and ways that these, these individuals are connected. And I plan to continue to show you how that is going to look. I want to spend some time talking about our young adults and to uh, the fact that they're important to our overall church. See, we have to realize that these young adults, these are the men and women who are going to be standing in our places at some point. When we're long gone, they're going to be the ones that are up here. They're going to be the ones teaching our Sunday schools. They're going to be the ones that are preaching on Sunday mornings. These are going to be the people who are stepping up. See, the problem is, though, that we're experiencing something where many of these young people are leaving the church. And by leaving the church, what they're saying is... Uh, some of them are saying, I'll never return. And some of them actually do return. But what happens when they're gone is there's what little maybe they knew about Christ when they left has now been compromised by the world. The world and, and the way that the world functions is telling them that to live like Christ is, is not the right way to do this. And it's filling them with ideals, uh, false doctrines. See, the, the doctrines of our church forefathers, it's, it's being viewed as outdated and irrelevant. It's being viewed as something that we no longer need. And as they leave this church, that's, that's sometimes the mentality they'll come back with. While taking my own survey, I found out that these individuals, these young adults, they, uh, they do enjoy meeting together. They are seeking truth but the problem is the church is often a turn off to these individuals see they sense that people are too fake at church again hypocritical comes to mind these are, are individuals that are, are finding many different reasons to leave the church but we need to find reasons to keep them at church and part of, part of the reason that uh, we're experiencing some of this is because as parents, maybe we haven't been doing our jobs. And I, again, I don't want to beat up on parents because I, I know there are many of you out there, there that are doing great raising your kids. I see it. You know, when we teach youth, it's such an amazing thing to see some of our young people. And it's like, wow, they're getting it. They understand God's word and, and they're, they're putting it into practice. And, and that's awesome. But Sometimes as parents, we're, we're dropping the ball and, and we just need to realize that when that happens, there, there's consequences. The next slide tells us uh, a little bit about that. 
Six and ten young people will leave the church permanently or for an extended period starting at age 15. Again, as, as we are in youth ministry, uh, Dave and myself, we see this frequently. It's, it's, it's really sad. It, it kind of hurts. Uh, it hurts a lot, actually, you know, to, to see young people who are, are walking away. They're, they're tending to walk away from the faith altogether, it seems like. And again, there are many that will come back, and that's, that's awesome. But we need to fight this right now as, as parents. See, today, young adults are marrying later, if at all. Young adults are technologically savvy, and they hold worldviews that are alien to their upbringing. See, uh, Barner Research President David Kinneman, after a five-year study, he declared that the church leaders are actually unequipped to deal with this new normal. So we have a new normal, the, the technologically advancement, the, the fact that people are no longer uh, marrying. We're having to, to deal with this within our churches, and we're just not ready for it, is what he's saying. See, and when that happens, there's actually two dangerous responses that we can make. Their response... Uh, is mostly at extremes, both dangerous. Many ignore the situation. See, we'll ignore the situation, hope, hoping that young adults' views will be righted when they are older and when they have their own children. These lit- uh, leaders, they miss the significance of the shifts of the past 25 years, Kenneman, kind of, contends in the needs for ministry uh, young people have in their present phase, if it is a phase. So we're saying, well, let's just let them ride this out. It's okay that they're not coming to church. We'll just let them make their own choice to come back eventually. But what Kinnaman's saying here is we need to be ministering to these individuals now. We don't need to just let them try to find their own way. We need to still be trying to build into these individuals, try to help them understand the importance of, of, of faith in Christ. There's also the opposite reaction that's just as problematic. We, we use all the means possible to make the congregation appeal to teens and young adults. See, the problem is that this excludes, um, this excludes older generations. So, the way to confront this, the way to combat this, is to build the church on the preferences, uh, instead of building the church on preferences of young people, we need to build intergenerational ministries. We need to gather together the generations that have gone before. We need to step up and say, you know what? I'm going to lead. I'm going to be a mentor to these individuals. I'm going to walk beside them. In many churches, you know what this means? Changing the metaphor from simply passing the baton to the next generation to a more functional and biblical picture of a body. That is the entire community of faith across the entire lifespan, working together to fulfill God's purpose. You know, I think about uh, the Apostle Paul. He didn't just say to Timothy, here you go, Timothy, this is yours. I'm going to let you take over from here. And I'm just going to go retire, going to go live my own life and, and, you know, have fun. No, he he walked beside the people that he mentored. He, He stood up and he said, you know what? This isn't so important. I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. I'm going to walk beside you until you do get this. So adults, let's walk beside our youth. Let's walk beside our children. You know, come beside other people's children. Maybe find ways that we can lead together. The next slide uh, speaks about a recent uh, survey that was conducted by the Barna Group, a leading research organization whose focus is on relationships of faith and culture found that less than 1% of young adult population in the United States has a biblical worldview. So, of the entire young adult population, 1% in the United States has a biblical worldview. Now, here's, here's something a little bit more scary. The data shows that less than one half of 1% of Christians between the ages of 18 to 23, has a biblical worldview. So within the church, we're actually less likely to have a biblical worldview. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something here, but to me, this this statistic is completely wrong, but but this is truth. This is what we're, we're dealing with. 
You may be asking yourself, what, is, what does it mean, a biblical worldview? The next slide goes on to tell us what a biblical worldview is. Uh, Barna has defined the biblical worldview if they believed absolute moral truth. Whoa, that's like a big one today. To believe absolutes is, is in a lot of circles, is absolutely wrong. To, to think that there's anything that's absolute is, whoa, you, you can't make that statement. Uh, to believe... A biblical worldview means to believe that the Bible is completely inerrant, without error. To believe that Satan is real, a real being, not symbolic. To believe that a, a person cannot earn his way into the kingdom of God through good works. A biblical worldview means that Jesus Christ, uh, we believe that he lived a sinless life on earth. And that God is the supreme creator of the heavens and all the earth. And he reigns over all creation. Again, this, this seems very straightforward, but we're, we're just not living this way. We're not living with the biblical worldview. Additionally, two studies conducted, uh, both by the Barna Group, found that nearly 75% of Christian young people leave the church after high school. One of the reasons they do so is intellectual skepticism. So they're just, they're too smart to believe that the Bible ha has any truths to, to hold them. They, they think that, you know what, I've outgrown these silly doctrines, right? But I tell you what, you know what, the Bible has withstood thousands upon thousands of years. And it will continue thousands upon thousands of years after we're long, and long gone. But the problem is, this is a result of our youth not being taught the Bible in their homes. This is a result also of them not being taught the Bible in their churches. And we're trying to combat this. We're trying to say, you know what, we want to set up a, a biblical worldview from a young age. And I appreciate Pastor Debbie. She does such a great job of, of really starting our young people out in the right way. I mean, I'm just always impressed the ways that my, my own children come and, and they're so excited about learning the Bible and they're excited about knowing the books of the Bible and, and knowing biblical facts and it's such an awesome thing but, but so often we as parents we don't get to maybe we, we just rely on the church as being that only means for their, their spiritual foundation we, we don't try to do this at home we just leave it to their churches Statistics show that our kids today spend an average of 30 weeks or 30 hours per, per week in public schools where they're being taught ideals that are uh, diametrically opposed to biblical truth. They are being taught evolution and the acceptance of homosexuality as, as well as many other things. And, and again, I know we have some great school systems and, and I don't want to negate that, but, but overall in the world, this is kind of what we're facing. Then they come home to another 30 hours per week in front of the television. They're bombarded by lewd commercials. They're uh, bombarded by raunchy sitcoms. Or th maybe they're connecting with friends on Facebook, Instagram, uh, online chat uh, chatting with, with one another. They're playing games. See, think about this now. <laughs> the time that we spent in church in the Bible in a biblical classroom is, is 45 minutes a week. Now, 45 minutes a week compared to 60 hours, I, I think we're, we're in a losing battle if that's all we have. If we only have 45 minutes a week that we're spending with God, then there's definitely something wrong. And, and again, I, I admit I'm guilty of this as well. I, I, you know, I had to convict myself of this. Uh, we were doing something for Lent with our youth group, we're just telling them about the fact that it's okay to give things up. You know, maybe we don't um, all give up the same things, but it, it's okay to do different things. And I realized, you know what? There's a lot I need to give up myself. There's a lot more time that I need to be spending with God. I need to be maybe uh, just tithing a certain percentage of my day to God rather than just saying, you know, God, I'm going to give you whatever I have left over. I'm giving God what I have first. I'm planning to meet with God rather than just saying, you know what? I'll meet with Him when I meet with Him. Again, this is, this is why we are where we are. It's no wonder that our young people leave home without a Christian worldview. 
It's no wonder that our young people are, are being lost to the world. Not only are they not being well grounded in their faith, but they're also not being taught to intelligently examine the views of the skeptics, the people that they're buying into their lies. They don't, they don't critically think about these lies before they buy into them. See, they're not being taught to intelligibly examine the views of the skeptics who are inevitably challenging uh, their faith. Most of these students are not prepared to enter college, the college classroom, where more than half of all college professors view Christians with hostility and take every opportunity to belittle them of their faith. Now, Dave had mentioned the fact that there's a movie that came out this week, just actually uh, hitting on the same thing. God's Not Dead is a movie where, where you know, there's an atheist professor who is... is making students right from the very beginning that God's dead. And and we're we're living in a world where this is so, we're living in a world where when students believe in Christ, they're they're looked at as not being intelligent. They're looked at as, well, you know what, how can you actually believe those things? They're not realizing the importance of the foundation that they they should have. uh, If they don't have that strong foundation from the beginning, then it's going to be easy for these professors to knock what little faith they have away. There's no question that a key factor in whether young people remain resolute in their, their Christian faith or walk away from it is, to, is the influence of their parents. Again, parents, we have such a huge role in our children's lives. We play such an important part. If you'll go to the next slide... Proverbs has a lot to say to parents. And maybe you're a parent that's struggling. Go through Proverbs. Look through there. Because I, I'll tell you what. There's some great words of advice for us. It says the Proverbs say, Train your child in the way he should go. And he will not, uh, when he is old, he will not turn from it. Think about that. Again, this isn't a promise. This isn't saying that, you know, if you're, if you're leading your children in the right way, that they're never going to turn. Because there are instances where children will go their own way. Uh, And again, that's part of the world that we live in. But to understand that we are given so much better chance when we put a Christian worldview into their their lives, when we set standards that are different from the world's standards, when we fight the students, the, the youth that we have, the our children, they stand a better chance because Uh, We're building that foundation. We're helping them to understand the importance of that. The next, uh, the next slide says that um, there's another study. This was by an individual church, and it says when both parents were faithful and active in the church, 93 percent of their children remained faithful. When just one parent was was faithful, 73 percent of their children remained faithful. When neither parent was particularly active, maybe they were, you know, somewhat active. They they came to church on a semi-regular basis. 53% of their children stayed faithful. Now, in those instances where uh, their parents were not active, where uh, they only attended church now and then, these probably would fit into the Easter and the Christmas crowds. The percentage dropped to a 6% chance that the, the students would stay faithful in church, that they would remain in the Christian faith. So, again, we have to start by combating this. We have to start by fighting. Uh, with our purity retreat, the, as the young men, we talked about taking up the armor of God and taking up all the armor. We need to be taking up our armor daily. We need to be fighting. We need to be ready for battle. We have to begin by fighting uh, for the truths of God. We need to learn these truths ourselves, but we need to teach others these truths as well. If you're a mother and father, you need to ensure to teach your children God's truth from a young age. See, if we don't teach them God's truth, those in their schools, those in their jobs, those in other areas of of life, they're going to quickly fill in for you and they're going to teach them the worldview of the world around them. 
And if that's the way you want them to go, I, I guess I'll add it. But, but again, parents, we need to step up. If you are the first in your family to become a Christian, live out your faith. Let those around you see you living in a way that they want to uh, mimic, that they want to imitate. We, we talked about that in Philippians 3 this week, that, that Paul is encouraging the, the Philippians to imitate him. We should live a life where people want to imitate us. If you're a wife of an unbelieving husband or, or maybe a husband of an unbelieving wife, remain faithful, pray, love, respect them. Be Christ to them. If you're, uh, if you're not a parent or you have children that are grown, continue to be mentors. Don't just say, you know what, I'm retired, I, I've earned the right to enjoy life. Yeah, that, that may be true, but we don't give up ministry. We don't give up loving others. We don't give up living the Bible. We, we continue on. You guys that have gone before have so much to give to us. And I am so thankful that we have such a great body of believers here. And I'm so grateful that we have men and women that are, are stepping up in these capacities. Men and women that are leading the next generations to come. And, and again, I just encourage you to continue on in that way. But if you're not, realize the importance of that. Just as Moses had Jethro and Ruth had Naomi and Paul had Timothy, it too should be said that you are a mentor of some kind to a great Christian mind of today. That you are, are somebody, uh, just to think that you may be somebody's Jethro or somebody's Naomi or somebody's Paul. You may be a great mind that's, that's building up believers that's coming and walking beside them. The next slide, please. We should be passing on God's wisdom from generation to generation. Psalm 145, 4 describes one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. So, again, let's not drop the baton. Let's not, let's not just say, you know, okay, here you are. Uh, the ministry is yours now, and, and good luck. Let's, let's come beside each other, walk beside each other, and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I know the road is going to be hard. It, it's been hard for me, but I want to walk beside you, and I want to show you that when we walk together, it becomes easier. It becomes better, and, and our ministries grow because of that. See, if we don't pass on God's word, we experience what Pastor Joey described uh, in his teaching from Judges. He's talked about generations that have forgot the Lord. We're, we're living in generations that are forgetting the Lord. And when we forget the Lord and walk our own way, you remember that cycle that happened? Things continue to get worse. We're kind of in that cycle. We need to stand up for the Christian faith. We need to stand up for the doctrines that we once held so dear and stop letting the world tell us what to believe. See, if we don't want to lose this entire generation of men and women, we need to stand up as men and women and ensure we are standing firm on God's word. Maybe you're a man that you've not been plugged in anywhere. Again, I encourage you, find a way to be plugged in. Find a way that you can get involved here. Find a way that you can serve others. Come to the next men's ministry meeting. We'll, we, we try to meet on a monthly basis. We, we've kind of fallen away from that in the last couple months, but we're, we're planning on uh, again starting up again, and, and we'll have work projects. We'll have ways that we can gather together. I, I understand it may be uncomfortable. It may be out of your comfort zone, but I want to encourage you that you know when we're out of our comfort zone, again, that's times when we grow. If you're a young adult between the ages of 18 and 25 and you want to gather with others your age, you want to, to grow in your faith and you want to just find others that are like-minded, I, I have a sign-up in the lobby and, and I really encourage you to, um, to sign up a, a, as possible. It's at the same table where Dave has the, the youth ministry uh, materials set up. But again, just sign up because I'm really wanting to start another... Uh, opportunity of young adult ministry. I want, to, I want to make another go at it, but I can't guess what you guys want to do. So I need input from young adults throughout this congregation. What would you enjoy to do? 
And again, I, I just encourage everyone here to get involved, to to stand up. Again, we you know we're we're doing our vision talks here uh, for the next several weeks, and and there's going to be other ways that you can get involved. But again, we have so many in this congregation. I, I just would would pray that each and every one of us would be involved in in ministry in one way or another. Find ways that you can build others up. And again, maybe it is being a mentor to others. And I, I'm just, again, I, I think about the mentors in my life and to think about where I would be without these mentors. Where I would be if it wasn't for great men and women of God that have come beside me. Be a great man and woman of God that you are, that God's called you to be. And walk beside these individuals. Whatever that looks like, I mean, parents, we need to step up. Whether it's, you know, teachers, you know, ways that you can get involved and, and speak truths into the students' lives. We need to find ways because, again, we're living in a world where we're, we're losing. We're in this battle that we're losing. So let's, let's stand strong. Let's take up our armor and get ready for battle. Let's fight this. And we know in the end, we know if you flip to the end of the, the Bible, we know in God's Word that there is hope. We know that there is a uh, winning side and, and we're on it. We need to stop letting the world win. We need to stop giving them ground. We need to stop letting erosion occur. Set our stakes in the ground. If you'll join me in praying, we'll, we'll dismiss after this, but join me in praying. Lord, we just, we thank you for meeting us here. Lord, I... I'm so excited about these two groups of individuals. And Lord, I know the statistics are, are a little bit scary to think about. But Lord, I, I just pray that everyone in here understands the importance of these groups. When these groups are not present, Lord, we're, what we're doing is losing generation after generation. Uh, the reason we're in the situations we're in right now is because we have not taken a solid stand upon your word. And Lord, I pray that it would be said of Stones Hill that we have decided upon this day to take a stand. That we're saying, no longer, world, will you be taking those individuals away from us. We're going to fight for our loved ones. We're going to fight for our young adult children. We're going to fight for our men in this church. And Lord, again, that, that often it starts right there in the home. And I thank you for wives who have, have been taken the brunt of this for for many years maybe they're the only ones coming to church and and lord it's very discouraging because lord they've been praying for for year after year about their husbands attending and, and just to know to no avail but lord we know that when we remain faithful you too remain faithful and, and again that may not be every circumstance but lord we see it time after time where uh these great stories come out of of those that wait patiently. But Lord, it, it involves us taking the stand. It involves us continuing to pray. It involves us stepping up for what's right. Lord, help us just to always be willing to step up. Let us always just be willing to look for ways that we can serve you and serve others and, and just love others because of the love you have first given us. Lord, we thank you for meeting us here. And again, I just pray for these individuals here. I pray that everyone here just understands... Uh, that we're all encouraged, we're all uh, commanded to take a stand in, in different ways. And, and Lord, I just, I thank you for this day. And, and I just pray all this in the, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.